Beanie fans and welcome to another episode of the Shite and Sarcasm Engineering Show fronted by yours truly, everyone's favourite jumped up twat on YouTube and who's five, that would be me. Today, by popular demand, and I mean seriously popular demand, we've got the Trek Mad One. You can literally ride a Vagwina bike. So lots of people on my Instacrap account, email, all these people asked me, can you do something on the, have a look at the Trek Mad One and um, you know, talk about it for a little while. Uh, as always, remember to look me up on Shitstagram, Patreon slash Hambini, and there's some pictures I've used, which uh, I'll put some credits in the description. By Hambini, aged five. Right, now, this is the bike. Now, on the face of it, it doesn't look you know, too indifferent to um, uh, any others. But before we carry on, we need to check the pen is working. It's important today, because if the pen isn't fucking working, we're in trouble. Because we're going to be dawdling, doodling all over this thing. Uh, I might actually pick a different pen colour. Um, because you know, once you've had black, you won't go back. Um, screen pen. Fuck, where's the pen colour? Ah, ink colour, here we go. We can have a nice shade of blue. Right. So, uh, it might not be bla blazingly obvious from the picture, but this seat post actually does that. Okay, so this is the Trek Madone. Oh, Mad One. I'm just taking the piss, really. Uh, disc brake bike. Widely touted by them to be aerodynamic, but anyway, disc brakes. So there's a 10 watt loss straight away at 220. Um, and uh, you've got the aerodynamic handlebars in here. Um, not particularly deep wheels, I might add. Not very deep wheels. And quite a high spoke count. So the gain you'll get from, you know, various other, you know, from that frame is probably negated by the wheel choice. But, you know, we're not here for that. Um, the other thing to note on this bike is they appear to have beefed up the bottom bracket area massively. Um, I mean, it is, there's some serious amounts of carbon in there, so it's it's you know, it's not it's not a, a lightweight bike by any means. Usually they're about eight or nine kilos, um, but you know there you go. So yeah, but what we're here to talk about is the seat post. Now they haven't officially released this yet. Oh well, if they have, I haven't seen it. Um, I don't know what kind of spin they're going to put on this, but what they've done is they've put a great big fucking hole where the seat post meets the top tube and done some other bits of shit around it. I don't know how best I could describe this, but we will carry on. Um, if they're going to go down the aerodynamic route and proclaim this is highly aerodynamic, it's like saying that um, your aerofoil section is proven aerodynamics in the middle of a hurricane. The airflow is so turbulent in that area, irrespective of what ball bag size you've got, that um, it's just just turbulent. Um, so in turbulence, whether you've got a brick or a knacker 0024, ain't gonna make a blind bit of difference. It's the 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 you know the, the stuff around it is the problem because the airflow is so turbulent, so messed up, so fucked up. It's not really gonna do gonna cut it. However, this is a previous generation of the bike. So this was um, I'm not sure which generation, but what they had in there previously was this, which is called an ISO speed decoupler, and it's effectively a way of reducing the vibration that the rider feels in here. Now I would just point out, and this is the this is the the difference. Um, to the new bike, so you can see this 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 part's gone, uh, and we're left with a cutout there, which I'm going to analyse in a second. But to go back to it, the the whole reason this ISO speed decoupler existed was because uh, vibration uh, isolation. Now I'm of the opinion that you want the stiffest thing that you can get. I mean, whenever I ask the hairdresser. She just says, you know, stiffer is better. And then um, she also comments about 
pussies and soft things and various other bits and pieces. But anyway, <laughs> sorry, I've got to stop laughing at my own jokes. <laughs> Someone paid me to put that in. Anyway, right, this, this ISO speed decoupler is effectively a way of isolating vibration from what the bike sees to what the rider sees. Now, if you do do that, what you're gonna do is you will lose some power um, because some of that uh, energy is absorbed in the form of friction um, and damping. But there is obviously the weight penalty on the bike for that and obviously the power transfer loss. But if you can offset that with your enjoyed comfort or better comfort, then you know it's a price worth paying. The thing to note with that is you probably need a bit of adjustability because a person's weight who's riding this bike could be you know quite a big variation. So you could have someone who's like 60 kilos and then at the other end of the spectrum you could have someone who's like 110 kilos. The vibration characteristics of the two people will be very different. The fat fucker has probably got lots of fat on him so his fat is acting as a mass damper so he probably doesn't need the ISO speed decoupler whereas the thin guy it's probably, um, you know, got very, very little um, mass damping on him. Um, so he, he probably just needs maximum damping. If that made, didn't make any sense, then I'll probably do a video on mass spring dampers. But anyway, so that's the, the comparison of the two bikes. That's me enough rabbiting on. Right, structural considerations. Now this bike, what I've done here is I've drawn um, a schematic of a wind space bike. So if you're wondering why the lettering on here is the wrong way around, it's, it'll become apparent in a second when I show you the other bike. It's just so I got them the same direction. But you can see, so here we've got the head tube. I better just change this color actually. So here we've got the head tube, uh, the seat here. And you can see it's basically a double triangle. The only difference to what they had in sort of 15, 20 years ago is they've moved the, um, point where the uh, stays meet the seat tube so where the uh, seat stays meet the uh, seat tube has dropped because I mean it used to it used to be like that so my look bike has the uh, triangle up there they've just lowered the triangle but there's still two triangles effectively so you've got one triangle here and another triangle here two triangles the reason why triangles are used is it's a very structurally stable shape because for a given length of sides you can't you can't deviate the shape whereas if you had a, um, a square like that and you made these joints all slack you could end up with something that looked like that so you got all of that to consider whereas with a triangle it's, it's rigid by design. Now, the Trek bike, this is what they've done. So if I just clear this slide, uh, point options. This is the, you could almost argue it's the space frame of, the space frame representation of what's, what's going on. So the key thing here is the seat tube actually bolts. Um, let me just change this color. And go for yellow right the seat bolts there or clamps or attaches there so you've lost this triangle here I'm going to draw some dashes in there it's no longer a triangle it becomes a parallelogram so you have um, got a structure that's significantly less stiff by design now in fairness, um, you know, to compensate, what they could have done is they could have made all of these joints much thicker, made the tubes thicker. Typically, you're not really going to get much flexion in the tubes themselves. It's more likely to be around the joints. The other thing that, um, I mean, uh, is, is noteworthy and the people that most people picked up on, I think most people picked up on, is the seat post. So the seat post is there so what you've done is you've created a cantilevered structure here and in order to compensate for that you have generated a moment there or a torque depending on which school of thought you're on 
uh, that has to be resisted. Um, in order to do that, you will have to seriously beef that up. If you don't beef it up, then the chances are you'll initiate cracks around there. So in short, you know, people are concentrating on this, but they've they've done a, a good one there as well. So on the front triangle, you've lost a load of stiffness. Um, obviously, they could put it back in another way, but it's not an efficient way to do it. Uh, so this is the free body diagram. So you've got that, that, and then there's the counter torque. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, there's a counter torque there. What will tend to happen is this will deflect like that because it's basically a springboard. Um, so if they're going to use that to uh, generate your uh, your damping, well, I don't know what kind of spin they're going to put on it. Anyway, right. So practical considerations now. If I go to take back to this picture, you've, you've got the seat post there, which I've drawn round. You haven't really got much adjustment because there's going to have to be a certain amount of overlap, let's say eight, nine centimeters. So you've got a limited range of sizing. So you're going to have to have much more steps through it or one bike is not going to have as wide a range as it previously would. Um, because the seat tube's not as long. Uh, so typically, you know, these integrated seat posts or what have you not, um, those bikes don't really sell that well in the second hand market. Um, a, a prime example is the Look 695 that came with an E post, and once it's been chopped, you've got to find one that's basically bigger than what you need in order to chop it down. Um, it's geometrically weaker, um, you need thicker sidewalls to compensate. And the manufacturing is way, way more complicated. Um, there must be like three or four pieces there that have been glued together. Um, and then if it's for damping, like I said previously, you haven't got any adjustment for weight. There's three real modes of damping. So there's friction damping, which was like a sliding element, which the previous gen Madone had. Might be a few generations ago, but anyway. Viscous damping, which is like your shock absorber in your car, so the damper in your car, um, which is typically a, a coil spring, and then inside you've got a, a piston in in oil that's moving up and down. Um, so that's the damping element. And then the Time Skylon, my one doesn't have it, but you can get one with a mass damper in it. So as you move along, um, when you get the vibration, the mass inside moves to try and uh, counteract it so the Taipei 101 building in Taiwan has a huge mass ball in the uh, in the roof that's designed to uh, move in the event of an earthquake so the vibration is absorbed in there rather than in the rest of the structure um, and I also said about you know the people who are fat or whatever like that you're going to have a certain element of anti-mass damping. Now, I would normally use women in tits, but you know, I get into trouble for all that. Um, but so there we go. Right. It looks like a modification to try and sell the bike. Um, I mean, I can't think of any reason why you'd want to do that. Um, they're going to put some sort of spin on it. Would I buy one? No, I would go and get the Skylon or the Windspace um, bike. Both of those really good and you know the, the, of proven design i think it's a technical step backwards um so yeah there we go i can imagine in in another sort of year or so we'll be going back to what we had before and that's it now if you enjoyed that presentation please remember to smash that like button and subscribe and if you didn't go screw yourself and as always keep banging your hairdresser <laughs>